we had, uh, the Internet Society actually has a project. It's in very germinal stage to create something like what you're talking about. It's called ISX, Internet Society of Linux. And uh, the current for the plan that we had was focused on the client with uh, things like the Tor uh, anonymizing software included with a uh, Linux desktop on a live CD. But it's a short step from that to add the Freedom Box type of functionality. So if you're interested in helping with this, leave your email address uh, as you leave and write ISX next to it and we'll put you on a, a, a list. Right, I mean you can decompose you can decompose this project work into pieces, right? There's infrastructure for privacy and secrecy. There's social networking in a disaggregated mode where you replace uh, with RSS feeds a whole bunch of intra-site behavior. Right? There's pieces of transition and configuration work. It's all stuff. You, you divide it up, you see how it goes. Yes? Um, just to follow up on that a little bit, it was interesting what you said about you know, Facebook got a competitor that really understood what, what it meant to be open and distributed um, and, and to allow things to move back up to the fringes. If you look at um, developer.myspace.com, you'll see that they actually relaunched a lot of their technologies to be using almost all open standards. Um, OpenID, OAuth, activity streams, um, you know, just about the whole the whole gamut of any you know, open license and open standard. And there are a variety of um, of open source projects that you know also use these. You know, there's L, there's Pinex, um, NoseRub. There's a, there's a pretty wide range of them. Um, so I think we we are sort of in that direction already. Um, but there's a lot more sort of dissemination. Well, and, and, and Mr. Burdock will never surrender the logs. That's where the money is. So what we need is to, you know, put the APIs in over there so that we can take the data out to over here. And at that point, Mr. Murdoch will begin to fight us. Exactly. It's like WordPress or Tumblr or status.net <coughs> cloning the Twitter API, except the Twitter API hasn't doesn't have a license associated with it, so it's kind of unknown what happens when all these WordPress blogs are using the Twitter API. However, a lot of these, these open standards or social networks are licensed. Well, that's lawyer's work. Then, we, uh, yeah, we'll deal with it. <laughs> so the one thing I sort of feel was missing from the landscape you painted was uh, spam and zombie computers. Um, as somebody who basically had a blog that brought down her friend's personal privately run server, um, with a gig and a half of comment spam, there's no images in that, it's all text. Um, it seems to me that a one major discouraging factor for people running their own servers right now is just this large you know, zombie that is out there throwing crap at everything. So <laughs> how does that change um, you know, what you've presented to us? And what kinds of things do we need to do in order to work against that? Well, so, uh, uh, so let's agree that um, there are two layers of things that we can do for people. We can give them technology for controlling uh, data they don't want to get. Um, and spam control in the email stream is actually at a fairly high level of goodness these days. Uh, comment spam on blogs is one of the reasons why blogs may not be the last thing we ever do. Uh, <laughs> And once again, there are, you know, things we can do to help. Um, the German government's on the right track about the zombies. Um, the German government says, gee, if you're here in Germany, we think you shouldn't use Internet Explorer anymore. Uh, that's, you know, that's the beginning of the end. Um, we're going to have a whole lot of cyber war pulse pounding this year. It's budget season. It's uh, an election year. Um, the Pentagon doesn't really want to be known for the war in Afghanistan. It will be very interested in telling us, keep us all cyber safe is part of our job. Could we have another $100 billion, please? And we do have to deliver a message, you know, we do have to. We do have to deliver a message that says, if you want to make American infrastructure safe, don't let Windows run here. You all know this. You, you really do. It's the elephant in the room. Our friends at Google, who, you know, are very sophisticated and they're very shocked, shocked, shocked that Google <laughs> got in. But where did they get in anyway? What operating system was it that Google should not have been running? 
oh my heavens to Betsy, people got stuff that fished them to malware sites that caused them to have terrible malware because they weren't running a browser that had no script in it. Uh, you, you are running a browser that has no script in it? Well, when you are running a browser that has no script in it, the kids in St. Petersburg will write less JavaScript to hurt you with because there's no fun running, writing JavaScript that nobody will ever run. I mean, there's no fun writing JavaScript, but... <laughs> We, 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 we actually do have to clean up the neighborhood in other ways. We have a net full of junk, and the junk is made possible by bad software. And we don't make any of that bad software. We truly don't. Our software has problems. All software has problems. We have problems that cause things to get knocked over. But we have no things that cause hundreds or even tens of millions of computers to get knocked over and lie there gasping for instructions month after month after month after month. Um, so running servers is not fun because the net's a crappy neighborhood. But we can help. I mean, you know, you take a modern distribution of free software and you install it on a box and there aren't any ports open. There aren't any ports open. And that's a social effort. You need to have the social power to go out there to every last person with a crap zombie infested machine. And I know a lot of them in the Bronx, I'm telling you. <laughs> See, 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 those people, see, those people like you and me probably could replace some computers that are presently running with $29 arm boxes right. that plug into the wall. And you know the lovely thing about $29 arm boxes, right? You could not install Windows on them by accident, <laughs> right? You couldn't do it, right? It would be really, really good for us to help people move to hardware they can't reach. <laughs> and, and, and if we do that, a lot of things will also get better that are buggy. Yeah. Let, let me just. Uh, 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 oh, just hang on, Jay. Let me get to other people. I promise you will. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, you are seeming to suggest that we, if we move into a distributed model, a model where each one has their own data and run their own social network connected. Peer to peer and solve everything. But building such systems has proven to be very hard. You have, you're suggesting that uh, we just figure it out, that uh, we'll get all and write the system, we know how to solve it. In fact, we don't really know how to solve this, this problem. It's not a solved solution. Because it's very easy for you to stand and talk, uh, give an over. But when you put it down into the details, and the person before me, suggested a very important problem. They are updating the software and securing the software. It's not very simple when you have to secure a software that runs at Google. You have to pay a very uh, massive personnel. Imagine having to secure everyone running a server on their computer. That is, is, is not a simple thing. And so what's running on your laptop? Not, not Spider-Man. I am going to use a laptop. What's running on your computer that you use every day? Uh, I, I, I have three desktops, so I have everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have everything, how's the, how's the Ubuntu update doing for you? So when the, the, the department is updating it, so it takes care of that, and there are people paid to do it. Ah, but, but you see, there's nobody paid to update mine, and it's updated every 24 hours, it works real well. Are you sure the problem is as hard as you think? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so, so, so we have. So now, what we have is a data disagreement. There are a bunch of people in the room who, like me, think that some of the things you think are hard are hard, and some of the things you think are hard are easy. And the things that Facebook needs to be replaced with aren't the hard ones. No, because you are not listening out. I'm trying to say it's not only the updating. Updating is one of the things. Is how to properly set up the, 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 the system, how to make it so that it looks uniform across computers, how to make it so that it has a, a user experience that would be understandable to your friends, for example, and to whomever wants to join your network. Will everybody have their own different network? And also, when we are in everyday life, 
we visit coffee shops, we visit other social places. Why? Why don't we call everyone to come at our apartments? We visit other places because they offer value added services. This value added services cannot be offered by the individual all the time, we, or by a network of individuals. I just want to say, if the problem wasn't hard, it wouldn't be any fun. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 are, we are having a conversation which, which, in the absence of details, is not working well. The reason it's not working well is that I, at least, and maybe other people here, think that, to be really, really brutally honest about it, you're not living in our world. We think we live in a world where those problems are way more solved than you think, and where the things that are concerning you, we worked around a long time ago. We may be wrong in thinking that, but I can't be the only person in this room who thinks that you don't understand where we are now compared to where we were five years ago. Yes? I have a question about something a little bit related to that. Um, can you say something comforting to those of us who are too chicken? You mentioned running an onion router on these $29 boxes. Can you say something that will make people feel less chicken about doing that? Because all I've ever heard about doing that on your home computer or whatever is it will end in tears and disaster and ruin your family. And, and why will it do that? Because the, the government will come to you and say you're serving child pornography on our ah. computer. And you know, we, we need all of your computers and we have a subpoena and your lawyer says we can do this and you know, get out of our way. So we're not taking all of your stuff. Which kind of comfort did you want? A <laughs> legal services policy right. or a statement that the United States government has better things to do or uh, um, that's not really the way it's working these days, but I can't tell you that uh, Barack Obama isn't going to have an outburst of Big Brother in the second term. Or, I, I, I would say to you, I would say to you that lots of people wanted you to be afraid about that. The most, most powerful people who wanted you to be afraid about that were Verizon and AT&T, and they wanted you to be afraid about that because more than anything else in the whole world, they did not want you to run an open wireless router. Because if you ran an open wireless router, they were dead. And so enormous amounts of money and vast political clout went into asking a lot of people to be silent while they told you through all sorts of channels, some of them disclosed and some of them pretending to be independent voices, that you mustn't do that or else. I'm not sure, if, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm not sure if you misunderstand, but I'm talking about uh, onion router. I know, but what I'm telling you is the be scared of Tor is really a descendant of be scared of an open wireless router. It really started with bandwidth guys trying to prevent the telephone business from dying. The success in scaring people away from that means that there are a lot of other people now piggybacked on top. I run an open wireless router in my apartment. I do that for a reason. I run a tour router in my apartment. I do that for a reason. The reason is that I hope they come from me instead of you. <laughs> because if they come from me, so I won't be scared. I used to work in a research laboratory where they did wireless networks, and all the people who invented Wi-Fi all run open, wire, open access wireless routers in their houses. And these are the people who invented it and understand it, you know, and, and theoretically, you know, understand the security implications. So it's interesting that you're comparing it to that because that they can sort of see and believe. And I have no problem running an open, you know, wireless router in my house. Like that doesn't scare me somehow as much as the story. Then I think what you when should do when we ship network. you when we ship you the thing, <laughs> and you connect your browser to it for the first time, and it shows you the check boxes. You should probably uncheck Tor, because I don't want you to be frightened. <laughs> and if I find a lot of people don't want to have Tor, then maybe I ship it with Tor turned off for a year or two or three. But I tell you, when you make a Chinese friend, you may decide you feel differently. And so what I think is you should know that you won't have to worry about that in the same way that you won't have to worry about the crashing, data-destroying bugs in your Linux kernel. <laughs> because somebody else will have fixed it already. Come along behind us. 
I'll run the Tor router for you for a decade, and you'll watch. Okay? And if I'm standing here 10 years from now, uh, still unbloodied and unbowed, <laughs> Look, I remember, I, I, in 1991, after a bunch of looking around for somebody with the courage to do it, I found a guy called Phil Zimmerman in Boulder, Colorado, who was willing to do a thing you shouldn't do, which was to teach people how to use industrial strength public key cryptography in a program that ran on a PC that anybody could use and read. And people said, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and in fact, the night I saw PGP for the first time on a FIDO bulletin board here in Manhattan, I wrote an unsolicited email message to the guy called Phil Zimmerman who had written the thing, and I said, congratulations, you're gonna change the world. You're also going to get in a shitload of trouble. <laughs> and when it happens, I can help you. Here's why. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. When trouble strikes, call me. And I was two weeks ahead of the nice, kind, custom service investigator who knocked on Phil's door in Boulder. Okay? And we fixed that. Okay? You're not afraid to use GPG anymore. You're not afraid that if you take your computer with you on vacation outside the United States, you're going to get arrested for exportation of cryptography. You're not afraid that they're going to come to you and say that you're abetting nuclear terrorism and pedophilia because you encrypt your email. There were people all very afraid about that in the early 1990s. And that's why Phil and I had to do what each of us had to do. I, I hear you. I hear you. It's frightening you. It shouldn't, but that's not your fault. Powerful people want you to be frightened of something we're not frightened of. So let us deal with it, and then you'll see. I hear you. We will fix it. What about the ISP's terms of service? Because for residential service, AT&T, Verizon, the cable companies, they prohibit private running of the server. And the business plans either don't come to the home or they cost a lot more. Well. Call, call me out. I'll, I'll set you up. Um, so, so, right, so, 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 um, Best Buy, not a bunch of people I'm particularly fond of. In fact, I've got a GPL compliance lawsuit pending again. <laughs> um, Best Buy, it does still own Speakeasy, um, but they know better than to mess with the business model. So maybe you need a DSL supplier who doesn't impose those bad terms on you. In fact, uh, if your friends at Verizon discover that you are leaving along with five or ten thousand of your neighbors in your zip code in order to go to Speakeasy because you happen to dislike terms of service that tell you you're only allowed to be a client, uh, then they will fix that. They will have to fix that. Their problem now is they must offer DSL service to you on the terms you will accept. If they don't, you're lost to them forever. You're never going to buy Fios on the terms you won't accept. You're going to leave the telephony system behind. You may even be ticked off enough not to be a Verizon Wireless customer. DSL to home is now a commodity they have to get you to take. Because if they don't, then you're not a secure platform inhabitant. <laughs> and so they will have to negotiate with you if you make them. But you won't walk away just yet, A, because you think there isn't any better deal, although in fact there are. Um, and, you know, we're standing in a big university. It could put its Ethernet way out into Greenwich Village if it wanted to. In fact, it should. In fact, my dear old friend John Sexton, who's been busy buying up little pieces of lower Manhattan, should have been leaving behind NYU University Services everywhere he went. Had he done so, the Verizon would be back on its heels in lower Manhattan. I have um, nice service. Not maybe compared to France, but compared to everywhere else. Uh, in fact, I really do have nice service. I have 100 megabits to home, and it works great. And I pay $39 a month for it, and my ISP is Columbia University, which I kind of like because I have tenure at Columbia <laughs> And if my ISP misbehaves, <laughs> I have recourse. <laughs> All right? um, we, need, we, need, we need to take a hard look. We need to take a hard look at bouncing around 
the bandwidth sellers in the United States. Yeah. We we do need to take a hard look at this. I, you, if you bother ever listening to the crap I say, you heard me say this many a time. Free bandwidth is the last and most difficult part of the revolution we are working on. And I used to think we wouldn't even begin to be able to come to grips with those guys who are way scarier than Microsoft and way scarier than Disney because way more politically powerful. I didn't think we were going to be able to come to grips with the free bandwidth problem in society until the 2020s. And I didn't think that because I didn't know that Mark Spencer and his friends were going to make asterisk. <laughs> But when we formed SFLC in 2005, one of my first priorities was get to Asterisk, make them a client, start protecting Asterisk. And within the limits set by its relationship with Digium, we have done everything we could to protect Asterisk because we're going to destroy telephony. <laughs> Now, here's the other part of this story, which you need to know. I know, I'm coming, I promise. Um, here's the other part of this particular story that you need to know. It is a public announcement of the Symbian Foundation. The Symbian Foundation finished, as you may know, as of Friday last, releasing all of Symbian as free software under EPL in nice Debianized packaging. So Symbian is an interesting operating system for technical study reasons, and it is now a free non-platform. More important still, the Symbian Foundation has indicated an intent to demonstrate somewhere between mid-February and mid-March of this year, that is soon, weeks, the making of telephone calls from a Beagle board using only free software and a radio chip. From a what? From a Beagle board, a Got project it. board. So we are a couple of weeks from proof of concept of totally free telephony using using what is now free software, which is currently installed on 330 million operating phones. So we're getting close now. We have PBX in free software that we can put into any switching gear in the world. We are going to have free telephony on free software with very limited reliance on the hardware and the patents that lie in the GSM stack. We are going to point some daggers at the heart of the telecommunications ISPs. And eventually, I promise you this, if, if we, the lawyers, are doing our jobs right and the technologists make good, we're going to be bargaining with them with our knees on their chests by the middle of the 2020s. I promise you this. <laughs> this is not a war we can't fight. It is a bitch, but we can do it. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, first of all, I want to commend you for, for the, the notion of the freedom box because you're, you're right. It's 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 necessary, but it's not sufficient. And I'm not focused on on some of the small little technical hurdles. I think there are two major hurdles that we have. One, which you just cited, which is the bandwidth limitation, which is the the asymmetry of how the infrastructure has been rolled out, both on the cable side and on the DSL side. The very asymmetric, all the bandwidth is for you as a consumer as if you're watching television, and very little it, it for you to, to, mm -hmm. to participate, mm -hmm. which is the essence of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how we overcome that. We, we had a panel here a few months back about you know structural separation of Ma Bell, but I don't want to go back in time. We could all see the video that, that Jolly posted up. The second big uh, hurdle that we have to overcome is the rest of society, and it's a societal, uh, a behavioral thing, which is the rest of the world doesn't understand why Facebook is evil, right? Why is, why is it a problem to, to have this stuff? Because that's where all my friends are. So it's necessary to have the freedom box so you can offer them all an alternative, but it will, it, the, the behavior, the, the messaging is going to be really hard to, to, to change their behavior. I'd love your thoughts about that. Um, so, uh, <coughs> right, the, 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 the broad, the, the big pipe down and the narrow pipe up uh, was an intended architectural consequence. I, I used to write uh, for the Nation magazine back when all sorts of things, mostly when the fact that I didn't get paid didn't bother me because I had a really superb editor. Um, and in, uh, in 1996, uh, uh, after doing some stuff about Microsoft and the music meltdown and so on, uh, I pitched a 700-word piece 
on why the FCC ought to require symmetric ESL. Uh, and the, uh, my editor, uh, Karen Rothmeyer, a very smart and very capable editor of the nation, said, it makes my eyes glaze over after five words. Why would I ever care? And I said, not this decade, Karen, but the next one. Um, but of course, you know, journals of opinion are about now. They're not about the future. What, what good would be if the nation wrote about the future? Um, so, so you're right. I mean, that's another example. We blew it, okay? Technology has in, in, in extraordinary social consequences. They minded their knitting. We didn't mind ours. We're behind the eight ball now. Uh, and my friends who talk about network neutrality, that's not, a, it, it's just unhelpful. It doesn't help us. Ne neutral isn't what we need. We need gravitational balance and all ports open, right? And then we're going to, we're going to take time to get there. And the pressure back from politics is going to be enormous. Um, but here's the thing. In, in, in the summer of 2005, I was in a European capital and I had a meeting with the CTO of a newly, no longer nationalized telecommunications monopolist, one of those people living in a fortress built after the war by the president of the newly free republic for the national telephone company. And we got in there, and we were two on the side, and we had our little cups of coffee, and then we slid the door shut. And the CTO of this thing said to me, OK, We'll agree with you. We will say here what we wouldn't say outside this room. Nobody will make money moving bits in the 21st century. And I said, good, I'm really glad to hear that we agree about that. But I must admit, it leaves me with a question. What's your business? And he said, oh, our business is the delivery of premium content to homes and businesses. And I said, thank you. I appreciate your candor about that. That's what I hear from our colleagues in the telecoms business in North America, too. But I got to admit, that leaves me with two questions. First of all, you don't own that content. Mr. Rupert Murdoch owns that content. So is your business to make Mr. Rupert Murdoch richer? Uh, second, you don't own that content. Mr. Rupert Murdoch owns that content. <laughs> and if you're right, and that's your business in the 21st century, and he already owns it, how come Mr. Rupert Murdoch just spent $600 million buying MySpace? Yes, he said. Thank you. We have heard that MySpace theory. And you could be right, he said. But if you're right, then we're just back to moving bits again. And I thought, boy, that's lovely. It was really as short as that. It's 90 seconds long. And we went for loop de loop, and he didn't have a business. Now, now here we are, OK? He, he still doesn't have a business. <laughs> And he was the lucky one because his government gave him years to continue the monopoly in return for delivering excellent service everywhere in his hexagonal country in return uh, for uh, the continuance of the monopoly. And he fulfilled. And his people inside their hexagonal country have excellent service at reasonable prices which with wide pipes up and down and they participate in everything. But no crypto. Well, don't be so sure. More you should have said, but weird three strikes you're out legislation that never dies no matter what, because it turns out that the bit movers, even with a good political inside deal, are less aggressive than the bit stream owners. Right? But, but, but all I wanted to, to tell that story for was to say, actually, we have the long run advantage over them. The problem is they don't have it. We, we do have the fact that in the long run, nobody will make good money moving bits in the 21st century. It just takes a really long time to get there. And now we come exactly to your second point. Why does it take a long time to get there? Because stupidity taxes are the easiest taxes to get people to pay. <laughs> and we got an ignorance gap, and we have to close it. And what does that mean? We've got to teach an eight-year-old. The good news is the eight-year-old doesn't believe in the sanctity of telephone companies. <laughs> the eight-year-old doesn't believe that they have a right to make money moving bits. The eight-year-old does not, in fact, believe any of the things that the eight-year-old would have to believe in order to grow up and be their customer. And that's our advantage. Their business is time limited. There's not a really solid business model underneath. There's only people don't know better. We'll get there. 
we so will get there. Speaking Teachers College. <laughs> you know, I taught at Columbia for 19 years doing some work that was kind of interesting in areas like this before anybody said to me, why don't you come and talk at lunch in the computer science department? <laughs> And I, and I I will say I was very glad to accept the invitation. And I went to a lunch talk in the computer science department. Every single professor in the computer science department, including the guy who invited me, skipped the talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I could barely get in the room because it was so full of graduate students and undergraduates who wanted to talk to me about some stuff. Uh, I'm happy to come to Teachers College. I don't expect a whole immense faculty turnout. Um, and I don't even know whether anybody really cares whether eight-year-olds are taught about this or not. I truly don't know. It's not obvious to me. I have friends, many, in a place in India, a tiny little place called Kerala with 31 million people in it, <laughs> in which the use of free software is universal in the schools, the use of free software is taught beginning at age five, and the philosophy of free software is taught in fifth grade at age 10. It's not that it can't be done. It's not that it can't be done. It's not that there aren't advanced models we could look into. <laughs> it's that we don't want to teach our children this stuff because stupidity taxes are the easiest taxes to collect. All you need to do is perpetuate ignorance. How to stop perpetuating ignorance is not a talk for a Friday night. <laughs> because there's so many people who want to go out and get stupid. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the tour conversation, yeah. I think we'd probably be a bit more comfortable taking that risk, perceived risk, if we knew what to do when things happened to us as a result. Yes, and the EFF would like to help you learn what to do when things happen to you, and it would be good to contribute to EFF, and it would be good to help EFF, and it would be good to look at the EFF website. But I must tell you that I have a little bit of experience in dealing with the secret world <coughs> in a hostile, adversary, legalized context over stuff they take seriously, like encryption. And I'm perfectly prepared to say, if you're feeling peakish about this, don't do it at home. Let other people do it. Really. <laughs> it's not a matter of feeling peakish about it but rather not having any kind of idea what the real risk is from a financial perspective or from a civil liberties perspective, being arrested, detained, or, or the usual, or having your reputation solved. I don't know what those realistically are. So it makes it hard to set a basis. I can't realistically provide you legal advice in a public place <laughs> concerning activities <laughs> of a purely hypothetical <laughs> nature. <laughs> In a context in which it would be irresponsible of me to appear to be telling you X will never happen, which lawyers don't say, do you really want to, let's have this dialogue, okay, let's do this, we'll do the one true lawyer conversation. You come to me and you say, I am thinking about this, what's my risk? Do you know what the lawyer says back? Surely you do. Oh, if you don't, I'll tell you, but the lawyer says, it depends. <laughs> That's the one true lawyer conversation, okay? And, and so I'll, I'll give you all the legal advice you need. It depends. Um, yeah. Now you want a telephone number? You want a telephone number, 212-580-0800. Okay, that's the Software Freedom Law Center. I don't actually do EFF's work, but you need a telephone number, and I gave you. If you're really thinking about this, and you decide to go out and experiment on your own, and you find a car that just seems to be parked across the street from you a little too much, call us, I'll, I'll refer you. <laughs> okay. But I would like to stay on the open floor. Uh, what happened to the Philadelphia opening the municipal citywide free wires? Bogs down in the private public partnership that you always get into when you talk about municipal wireless in the United States. And remember that the deal was Philadelphia can have it in return for the passage of a state legislation that says no other municipality in Pennsylvania can have one, particularly not Pittsburgh, where CMU might decide just to do it. Okay? Philadelphia wasn't the best possible place, and Pennsylvania wasn't the best possible state, and Ed Rendell wasn't the best possible governor, and uh, a Supreme Court that has purchased judges on it is not the best 
possible Supreme Court to have. Municipal wireless has so far not turned out to be the big city solution because big city politics aren't clean. And among the people who aren't clean in big city politics, the telephone companies are a very important piece of the story. Um, I'm not so interested in municipal wireless. I'm really, really interested in potato chip cans. In potato chip cans, Pringles cans. I'm really, really interested in self-assembled wireless. Municipal wireless is wireless run by guys you can't trust. <laughs> I don't care in which public-private partnership they exist, okay? I can trust my neighbor, and I can trust me, and I can trust the guy across the street with a Pringles can. When I want open wireless in Riverside Park, I point the Pringles can out my window. And I light up a little piece of Riverside Park on a Sunday afternoon, and I go out and work there, and people see me, and they say, is there wireless? And I say, yeah, it seems to be. And <laughs> <laughs> just fine. Because there seems to be wireless. And now, don't bother me. My backhaul is the Columbia University Network. <laughs> and if people want telephone service there, I'll give it to them. And another little client of mine called OpenBTS, which makes a GSM base station and a laptop with a coat hanger, I'll give them that too if the time comes, right? It, it, we, we're not actually defenseless against this. We don't have to wait for bigger powers. But right now, today, I wanted to talk about self-assembled solutions to privacy in the cloud. Self-assembled solutions to the bandwidth crisis, it's another good topic. Let's do it on a Monday. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So the other solution to privacy, which uh, you made, you implied earlier it was hopeless, is that you you make it useless to have the laws. So, for example, in uh, in evidence rules in courts, there's certain kinds of evidence you can admit if it was gathered legally, so people don't bother to gather it in theory. Is that totally hopeless? No, I don't think it's totally hopeless. I wanted to talk about something simple and optimistic, and things that hackers can do. Um, if we were really going to talk about this. I want to get out the pseudonymity riff and explain how we need multiple identities that don't link well in databases, because we always do this with that one, and this with that one, and this with something else, and we have identity management, which is meant for privacy, instead of what they're currently calling identity management, which is spying inside for free, yet again. Um, we, we, there are other roads to go. I, I, I didn't want to say this is it, and only it, and nothing else. And if I implied useless, I, I apologize. But what I would imply is we take the road I'm talking about now and we make a big public splash and we knock over a bad thing that shouldn't be there and then we start telling people, you know, there's more. We want to do some stuff that helps you bank better. We want to do some stuff that helps you shop better. We, we want to do some stuff that will help you to avoid all that. Gee, we just noticed you had a baby. How would you like to buy our this and that and the other thing stuff, right? We, 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 we might even want to talk about health care reform. Oh, no, we can't. <laughs> Though we really should, shouldn't we? I mean, we really ought to be talking about, do we really have to wait for them to figure out what the health information network ought to be? Or could we actually play a little bit of a role there? And, and could we affect the politics in each of these areas by being a little bit canny? So I, I would say, sure, and let's offer a course, and let's teach for 14 weeks, and learn from one another, and Lots and lots of stuff would come out. This was not meant to be an exclusive list. This was just meant to prove that we don't have to be really sad on a, sad, on a Friday night. That's all. You talked about the social networks and opening up the sort of data exchange. What do you think of the prospects for changing the free software licenses that govern all the software that a lot of these companies use to force them to open their data, their services, or whatever in that direction? Well, this is why the AGPL exists. It's a license meant to explore that turf. It's a license that we allowed for in the process of updating GPL, but not a license we could compel people to use because there is a conflict of freedoms here. The right to modify software and not share it with people is also a right. It's an important right. The right of private modification is the intellectual freedom guarantee in the free software world. You don't have to give people software. You don't have to show them. You are allowed to think your own private thoughts. If you're not, then we messed up freedom somewhere. 
So when we came into the GPL3 process, just to take an example of a software licensing thing I know a little bit about, um, when we came into that process, everybody said, oh my God, sky's falling. They're going to affarrowize everything and they're going to make us, do, and, and the financial services sector was ready to have the vapors. They thought that uh, a bad change to software licenses could really ruin the financial system of the United States. <laughs> so we didn't do it. <laughs> Much good it did us, you would have noticed. Right? Um, so, so we can't just, uh, so here we, I'm speaking on behalf of people who care a lot about software freedom and adjust licenses. We can't just adjust the license underneath to do that. We would be acting against freedom. We can create an alternative license that does that, and we can allow free software under an existing copyleft license called the GPL, where a lot of software is, to move in there if it wants to. If you look out there on what used to be Google Video and is inside YouTube, you'll find a speech I gave at Google some years ago in which I said, you know, if you didn't behave really well, if you ever actually started being evil, the Afero license would become for you what the GPO was for Microsoft. It would be the thing that went after your business model in order to redress a social imbalance. And I was, I suppose, you know, violating the one true rule of don't be mean to Google on its own turf. The little Tyrannosaurus Rex didn't fall over on me as I walked by. But, but it was a kind of an uppity thing to say, I suppose. I still believe it. It's important. Those, the licenses that say, if you're going to provide services over modified versions of this code, release your mods, they're important licenses. But they're important in a way for their interorum effect. More important is write code that offers services, release it under such licenses, and therefore begin to create a copyleft universe of code for the offering of free services. And if you look around the world right now, you'll find a lot of that. I don't mean a lot numerically compared to pure GPL code, but if you look in the world of service provision, it isn't just the signers of the Franklin Street Statement, it isn't just the people with the strongest interest in free services. If you follow the licenses on Freshmate, you will see service provision code is beginning to consider the alternative of beginning from the beginning with licenses that do what you suggest, which implies that the social pressure I was naming all those years ago in reflections on the world's largest computer and what it runs on, that, that the, the, the pressures that I was naming are beginning to have their ecological counterweight. People are using those licenses because they feel concerned. Also, while it may sound stupid, it's important to remember that it's perfectly legal and maybe even moral to charge a stupidity tax on free services. Well, it's a question of which ecological externalities you're allowed to impose in return. I don't know whether a stupidity tax that charges you money is exactly the same as a stupidity tax that deteriorates human integrity or even just eliminates the privacy of uncautious users. We have to ask what the ecological consequences are of code. The same way we asked about the ecological consequences of pesticides and air adulterants and drinking water problems in the 1960s and 70s. We need to ask ourselves how the technology individuals choose to use affects the larger overall social ecology. And I'm not sure that each and every one of those possible taxes, which are actually externalities of a negative kind imposed on the general public, we ought to be willing to regulate. The difficulty is that you can regulate the emission of pollutants more than you can regulate information flows because we have a First Amendment and we really care about it. How would the GPL help us better than the GPL? Because right now, uh, even if the even if like Facebook is running only on uh, uh, a GPL code, uh, we, we already know that uh, they're spying on us. We don't need uh, to be able to see the sort code. We should know that, that they're spying. Yes, a GPL's a GPL's primary advantage is not a primary an act to restore privacy. It is much more simply a question of getting all service provision code back into commons so that it is easier to fork and run in a privacy-respecting manner. 
If Facebook were made of AGPL components, then our colleagues concerned that we couldn't possibly duplicate it functionally because it's way too complicated would simply be de facto wrong. Right? We'd have what they started from, we'd have the mods, we'd be done. Um, it, it, the licenses are not the answers to social problems. I, I speak as a guy who cares a lot about licenses. But I tell you, once again, licenses are the constitutions of free software communities. They resolve problems inside the communities. They are not tools whose primary benefit is to be found in their external consequences. AGPL is a way for people who care about services freedom to work together in an assurance of services freedom the same way that GPL allows programmers who cared about software freedom pure and simple to work in the assurance of software freedom. When we begin to see massive collaboration in freedom respecting services, you'll see AGPL come into its own as a device for regulating and mediating collaboration like the function performed by GPL in the world of software you distribute. Yes? Um, has anybody in this room written a Facebook app? Just show of hands. So, uh, just written software for Facebook. I, I mean, I have to. That's the point of the question. Uh, uh, You'll know that Facebook has very strict rules about certain uh, data manipulations you can do, right? Like they forbid you from doing certain API calls in the name of their users' privacy. And it's it's a it's a curious fact about this code is law that they'll actually prevent you from seeing which users are running your application on Facebook out of privacy considerations. Now that information obviously they know, and and, and they and they block you, the developer, from knowing. Well, certainly. I'm, 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 I'm they want the logs. Why should they share them with you? Just because you're <laughs> developing software to improve their system. <laughs> right. I mean, but, but I mean, uh, they're, in, a, in a sense, all of those, all of those lines being drawn are, are somewhat arbitrary, and it's Facebook's best attempt at make, forcing de external developers to abide by uh, some, you know, gray area of, of privacy. Right? They don't want developers coming in and and just exploiting privacy in the way that they are. In the way that they... Right, in the way that Facebook is. Yeah, that, right. they, that, that is to say, they have a business model in which you provide code and they keep the laws. Right. And they're not going to share them with you. So, so what I, I guess I'm asking is, anybody running a federated service can behave in this, in this fashion. Users have demonstrated that they're basically insensitive to a third-party app developer having access to certain API calls and developer logs. How do, how do we make... Or, how do we make it necessary that 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 people care about that? Because it's 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 kind of secondary to their experience, even if they do get access to the code and their privacy is being respected. If we are actually running on a free application stack for social networking, then they will passively benefit from the activity of those who care in the same way that the people who use free software stacks now for operating system and application passively benefit from the pro-security and pro-privacy activity of people who are specialists in that as they benefit from the bug fixers and everybody else. We we cannot make everybody care about how every program works all the time. Right. I have read X source code in my life, but I don't do that for fun. Uh, I, would do that, I would do that because we represent people who might need us to read their code for a reason. I am very grateful that there are other people who read that code. So, so, so the users that are using the free, so the free software social services stack benefit passively from, from the freedom and privacy. And they, benefit pa and they benefit passively from our attempt to create rules about how that stack works, which are fair to users as well as developers, and put users' privacy first. Um, two, one, so two questions uh, pertaining to one subject. They might have to be quick, because we're running out of time. It was mentioned about uh, comment spam on blogs. And you said users need to be protected, uh, antivirus, etc. Um, and as it pertains also to email and spam, but also if you, you suggested with this uh, freedom box that somebody could plug in, have their data there, and then maybe they unplug it, but their services can still be reached. Presumably somebody else is kind of hosting it as a courtesy, shades of Tor, Freenet, whatever. Um, could not somebody, those, the spam issue and what I'm concerned about both pertain to bad actors. 
Um, somebody could monitor, you know, I've heard about core exit nodes being monitored. Sure. Somebody's watching everybody's traffic. If I'm hosting my fake Facebook club, uh, but somebody else is kind of nicely doing it for me, and I sort of get a top logs, but they have a packet sniffer watching all my exit traffic there. Um, that's we, we, are not, we, we are not assuming, we are not assuming, I think, that our goal is to build perfect software. I'm sure we won't. And I am not assuming that our goal is to quell all bad actors. I doubt that we can, and I don't think we're engineering for it. I think we are really engineering for a fairly simple outcome. Not only feature compatibility with existing social networking, but feature improvement. It doesn't have to be much, but feature improvement along every dimension, and you keep the logs. That's basically the spec. You keep the logs, you have everything you have now, your data, your social contacts, your feeds, your everything, pretty much works the same at, level seven, at layer seven as it used to work for you. But underneath, it's really quite different because we've re-architected this stuff which you as an application user on the web don't really ever need to understand. And we have abstracted from the client-server model back to the peerage model. And pretty much working all the same to you except a little nicer and a little easier and you pay one price once and nobody ever spies on you again. Is everybody going to rush right out and use it? No. Will the first 100,000 people make a difference? Yes. Will the next 100,000 people make a difference? Yes. Can the Facebook IPO happen? No. Is the world a better place? You tell me. Yes. I wonder if you talk for a second then about whether this might get into sort of a, a cycle. Because when you're talking about Facebook and you know we need to make a open, or rather a free stack to replace it, a free federated service that aims for sort of feature parity and hopefully feature improvement, you're still talking about sort of cloning an existing service, making a service that already exists and sort of building it with free software principles in mind because that works better for us. And when you're talking about a service that is so inherently uh, sort of about the network that it, that it accretes, the, the amount of users it can get involved and therefore necessarily needs to have a lot of mass appeal to be useful to users, then I wonder, are we going to just get in a cycle where we copy, we make a free Facebook, and then, but then all the users care more about whatever the next thing is that gets developed privately that we then have to sort of re-engage in this effort to make see, a free See, the funny thing is, Facebook. see, the funny thing is, Facebook is just the web with spying. It's not actually an innovation of any kind. <laughs> There's no actual thing happening there. The underlying data model of Facebook is the web with spying. <coughs> PHP? Uh, no, thank you. I, I don't actually want it, right? Uh, and, 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 and RSS, which I do actually want, but I don't want it if they keep the logs. That's all. We're not actually, what, what, what we're really doing is pulling stuff back into the web and changing how web servers are geometric. Uh, geometrically organized in a web whose topology is way more flexible than Mr. Zuckerberg can ever make. The, you're, you're asking another really good question, what is the platform for web innovation? So let me ask you, what do you think, if you're a guy with an innovative web idea, which do you want, Facebook, with its API monopolization or control model, which is the Microsoft API monopolization and control model brought to the web, or a couple of hundred million wall wart servers out there that people could apt to get to. I mean, if you have 400 million wall wart servers out there for you to use, then yes. I, I okay, so that's that. part of why I told you the Symbian story. Because part of what's happening is I just told you somebody freed the guts of a thing with 330 million boxes in field. Is that interesting to you? Yeah, it's very interesting. That, that is because there's some 330 million boxes? Mm -hmm. Will it interest you more if I tell you that Nokia assured me in the beginning of this whole long story that they have never sold an S60 phone anywhere in the world that prohibited installation of third-party applications? Right. Nokia says, 
I have no way of independently verifying this. Nokia says that at no time have they ever sold an S60 phone anywhere in the world that was locked down against the installation of third-party applications at the level on which they delivered it. So what do you think? Could we possibly be actually looking at a thing that comes a little close to what I just offered you that you say, well, if you had that? See, the funny thing is, I, I said this long ago about the DRM wars, right? Left to their own devices, they would never give us any freedom. But they're not left to their own devices. We have their devices. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I know what you mean. I understand your question. How do we accumulate enough to get to critical mass? I guess what I want to tell you is I think the critical mass is out there already. The question is how do we free it? I, that's good news, but I'm not sure. I, I think my question was actually more about how do we, I mean, how can we move from a mode of sort of feature duplication and feature improvement into sort of you know, you, you, you know, you, you do remember, right, when, when, when Richard and I were each a little younger and had less gray hair, that people used to ask us, how could we ever catch up with Microsoft? <laughs> you remember how that went, right? <laughs> and, and I don't hear that question anymore. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the network effects were so drastic. You, you know, don't. But they seemed pretty drastic to anybody who tried to compete with Microsoft except us. Jay, it's yeah. time for the last question. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I want to agree with what Abram said, of course, and with what you said, and with what the person from the Bronx said, and you, sir, right behind me. Oh, you may not be there anymore. Okay. Uh, what about me? I don't agree with you. Oh, of course, I always agree with Joe Plotkin. Okay. Um, your last question and the crushing of the server were very much to the point, particularly at this moment, because of the iPad. What is the iPad? The iPad is a machine with a claimed, completely, 100% competent team of sysadmins who have root of the iPad and will make everything easier. Now what Eben said at the beginning was, the internet was designed, and by definition of the RFCs, it's a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network. Only it's not, because as somebody here said, terms of service, they don't let you run a, a little Shiva plug freedom box. And also, it's actually very difficult to set up Apache. Every time I have to do it, I'm going to say, I'm frightened. And I have to go and I have to read the things. And the answer is that incompetent software tends toward infotainment central, controlling the entire world, including all of our should be private communications. That's why our software has to be not only better than what they've got out there, it's got to be much better. and we also have to sell it like hell. And I was going to say more, but it's not a so, so here's a cheerful thought to end on for a Friday night. And it comes from your question, what is the iPad? My answer is proof that Steve Jobs isn't perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot.